Hi, really quick. This video is sponsored by Klonoa's Yahoo Screams of Terror. So because I can't record a video regularly anymore, I decided I wanted to do this stupid thing where while I was recording the voiceover for this video, I had a video of silence interrupted by Klonoa by Zinnin. <laughs> I butchered that, I know I butchered. At full blast to make this video a bit more fun, I guess. I have no idea how this will go, so just know that going in. Anyway, on with the video. Hello everybody, Nitpicker here complaining about issues great and small for your entertainment and today we're going to be talking about Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series. But we're only going to be talking about the first game because that's all I have time for. God damn it, already? I hadn't heard much about Klonoa nor have I ever played it before even though I heard great things about it and I actually was getting ready to start a Klonoa series starting next year. And then imagine my surprise when Pac-Man himself announced in the Nintendo Direct that we would be getting remasters of Klonoa 1 and 2 in one collection under the title of Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series. Thank you Bandai, you made me start this series early while I'm trying to finish the Sonic series during Origins hype and in retaliation, I'm going to participate in hashtag Klonoa sweep and force you to make a new game. Anyway, I'm very happy these games came out and actually these games were supposed to be a timed exclusive on Nintendo Switch, but thankfully Namco changed their minds even though they had no real reason to. I don't think anybody was pressing Namco about it, and the game would have done so well on Switch, I don't know why they changed their mind so quickly. Maybe it's because Pack World Repack was ahead of schedule and they didn't want Klonoa releasing during that? I'm not sure. What I'm also not sure is what the fuck was up with the marketing for this game. I was ready to pre-order this game the minute it was announced, but pre-orders never open for Klonoa on any platform. Not even the Switch. And for the other platforms, it didn't even go up on other platforms. It just didn't exist until launch day. But leading up to the launch was even worse because Bandai didn't do any marketing for this game whatsoever. Not a single bit. Outside of the trailer at the Nintendo Direct, I saw no more trailers. And there wasn't even a trailer saying it was going to come out on other platforms. Bandai did not care about this game at all. But luckily, the fans pulled through and showed immense hype for Klonoa, and on Steam at least, it had record-breaking numbers across the board. No matter what I say about this game, I just want to say Klonoa fans are awesome and you all rock for this. More companies should take word of mouth more seriously. Klonoa is proof that it works, and marketing agencies should take more notes on this stuff. Either way, is all this talk worth it? Is Klonoa truly that good? Well, let's find out. Let's nitpick Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle. We open the game with the main character walking through a field and finding a ring crash landing close by. Once he gets it out of the ground, he finds a character named Hoopal, and the two become friends on the spot. They run around and laugh a bit, but then the world suddenly starts to go dark until we find out it was a bad dream Klonoa was having. Shortly after though, a mysterious ship crash lands into a bell and Klonoa and Hu Pao rush to check it out. From there we learn of Gaudius. How God damn it! From there we learn of Gaudius, a being who represents nightmares, therefore the people of Phantom Isle rejected him because nobody likes nightmares, they're scary! So he decides to consume Phantom Isle in a never-ending nightmare. And of course our heroes, Klonoa and Hu Pao, don't want that, so they sent off in an adventure to stop him and set free charming characters that have already been affected by his nightmares. Anyway, that's enough of the story for now, and trust me, there's a lot more we need to talk about, but it's one of those stories that give you enough to know what you're doing and then gives you a ton of lore at the end. So we're gonna save the big reveals until then. For now, we'll start this time with the gameplay because I just wanna, all right? The gameplay is a 2.5D platformer with tons of creative foreground elements and transitions. The game uses this for a lot of animated platforming and puzzles. Thankfully though, it never really feels like a gimmick. If you ever wanted to see the possibilities of a 2.5D platformer, you play Klonoa. They do it very well. Another thing that Klonoa does to set itself apart is Klonoa's weaponry. And no, he doesn't have a Glock. It's a wind ring, and you can use it to turn enemies into big balls and use it to double jump or throw at other enemies. But the former method is used a lot, especially for platforming during the final level. But we'll get into that 
a little bit later. The game also switches things up for variety by obviously introducing new platforming challenges, but also different enemies and stage hazards. An example being this bomb enemy, you need to destroy certain things or use them to activate certain switches at certain times. However, near the end of the game, there was this one concept that was never used again, where it would turn to night you couldn't grab on enemies anymore and had to avoid or wait on them. But what's so funny is that when it was dark outside, they are more derpy looking than their original designs. Either way, this was introduced in one level and not brought up again, which was just kind of strange. I thought for sure it was going to come back in the final level, but it didn't, and it was I was really confused. But in hindsight, I'm very happy about that, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. The game handled its difficulty very interesting at a lot of points. I won't say this game is hard, but it's definitely not easy. I did lose a few lives and a few more levels than I'd like to admit, and I think it's kind of funny how the game handles its checkpoints, because unlike other platformers, where you would just run through a certain point in the level, <laughs> nah, sometimes in Klonoa you gotta work for your checkpoint, dumbass! But I did feel that the game as a whole was a bit more precise than other platformers I played. Of course, not saying that's a bad thing, in fact that's actually a unique thing for now, but just know that it's probably a little bit harder than platformers you're used to. But with that being said, I didn't get many game overs until later in the game, but stop asking me about it. I said I'd talk about it later. If I talked about it at all, I'd talk about it later. The presentation is pretty in this game. They did improve how bright the game was because in the original Klonoa remake, it was a little bit too dark. But here in the remaster, they brightened it up, and it looks a lot better and closer to what you'd expect from something like this. One thing kind of dampering the presentation, though, is the in-game cutscenes. Of course, they aren't that bad, but they aren't the greatest either. The main issue is that a lot of times, Klonoa would just return to his idle pose when he's not talking, which means when something serious is going on, he'll just sit there and act like me when friends talk about politics. And it kind of ruins the game's ending a little bit if you're like me and pay attention to this shit. But hey, the pog face makes up for it. <laughs> now apparently in the original game, the game had, I think, three FMV cutscenes. So let's take a look. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, mm, I, uh, I see why they replaced these. And Klonoa looks fucking pissed. Me on my Fridays, me on my Mondays. Anyway, the next thing I want to talk about is voice acting because, well, there isn't any. It rips the grunts from the PS1, but what's weird is that the original Wii make this remaster is based off of did have voice acting, and a new design for Klonoa based off Klonoa 2, which is kind of interesting, I'm not gonna lie. I'm guessing the reason why voice acting was removed was because the remaster reverts Klonoa back to the PS1 style, which I actually prefer. And the Wii make in Klonoa 2, Klonoa is portrayed as more of a teenager. However, at least for me, Klonoa seems more like a preteen in the original game, and I feel like the story and ending especially feels a little bit better with him like that. And yes, we'll talk about the ending in a little bit later, don't worry. So since they reverted back to classic Klonoa, if you will, I guess they didn't want to hire a new voice actor, so they just reverted back to the grunts to get this remaster out the door as fast as possible. But really, I don't mind the lack of voice acting, I didn't really think it was needed. It was just very interesting they removed it in this version. The only thing I hate about it though, is that some of the text boxes take their sweet time going from character to character, but luckily the remaster adds a fast forward button to make the cutscenes go a little bit quicker, but it just ruins the pacing for me. And sometimes while fast forwarding I can accidentally skip some dialogue which can be kind of annoying. What cannot be annoying though is the soundtrack for this game. It goes for that atmospheric sense, but it's definitely a joy to listen to. And for some reason, they went pretty damn hard on the boss battle music. Anyway, I think we've talked about everything I needed to talk about. Let's see what else there is. Uh, 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 surely there's something else to talk about. Uh, how about Klonoa's character design was probably inspired by Sonic. And the game even uses the setup from classic 2D Sonic games, where it zones with two acts? That's interesting, right? Maybe we can go into more detail. No? 
<sighs> Fine, we'll talk about the final level which takes place on Gaudius's Moon Kingdom, and before I start complaining, I will admit this is one of the prettiest and best looking environments in the game for sure. But, <laughs> when I said this game was a little precise and wasn't that bad, just a little challenging, well, forget all of that, because this final level is precise and hard as hell. Enemies, moving balls that will bounce you into bottomless pits, and most frustratingly of all, very timed-based switches. And this is where you're going to feel something I have not touched on yet. I didn't even know about this until some Mexican brought it up in his video. Go watch it after this, by the way. But apparently, when you play on normal difficulty, your win ring is nerfed. And oh boy, you will really start to feel this on the boss of Vision 6. Because you'll have to hit the enemies in a specific spot in order to actually be able to throw a Gaudius. And it gets tough. And if you get a game over, you have to restart the whole level all over again. And I did. Do me a favor. If you play this game, please don't be like me. Play this game on easy mode. I know you may not want to, but please save yourself the headache because it's not worth it. Not only will you have more range on your attack, making the boss more playable, but if you fail over and over and over again, you'll be able to finish the game without going insane. Okay, now for this part, I need you to listen up. We're nearing the end of the game, and the game has an ending that, if you're gonna play this game, you cannot see it, because it's better that you go in not knowing what's gonna happen. Believe me, the ending of this game is... We'll say impactful, and 100% of that was because I didn't see it coming. And if you plan on playing this game, you don't want to see it either. Please skip to this timestamp right now, because there are massive spoilers ahead. Alright? Good? Good. But of course, it's not over yet. Because of course, there's one more final boss. Because Gaudius calls upon Nahatum to wipe out the world and consume it by nightmares. And thankfully, this boss isn't as stupid and is as strict as the last boss. And you don't have to worry about completing a level if you die. Either way, we beat and Hugh Pao sacrifices themselves. And then doesn't. And then we finish the game with a very wholesome, cute ending where Hugh Pal breaks the news to Klonoa that he's not real and will be sent back home after the Song of Reaper. Wait, 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 whoa, whoa. Uh, yeah, so I left this out on my story summary a little bit, but towards the end of the game, Hugh Pal starts to spill that apparently the dream that Gaudius spoke of, a traveler of dreams that cannot be corrupted by nightmares, is actually Klonoa, and Hugh Pao explains right now, at the tail end of the game, that Klonoa is not from the same reality as Phantom Isle and has to be sent back. So, wait, who's Klonoa then? Well, I, I guess we're about to find out. Wait, what? You can't just throw me a curveball like that and leave me hanging here? What the hell happened? So wait, 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 wait a freaking minute here. W was I Klonoa all along? Was this game sent in a dream this whole time and Hugh Pal trapped me in it to help restore the balance of dreams? And when Lephus sings the song of rebirth, that's me waking up? So, so is that- God damn it, I'm having an existential crisis! At the start of the game, the opening cutscene talks about a dream that the person remembers fully. So, is that me? So, am I Klonoa? What does the book fit into this? The stage selection is a book. The ending credits are in a book. So, was this whole game sent in a book of me rewriting my experience since my name is on the front of the book at the end of the game? Also, at the end of the game, after I close the book, it says for your Phantom Isle. What about Grandpa? Was he my real Grandpa or my fake Grandpa? Shut up! If he's real, did he die in my in real life? What about Gaudius? Is he the reason why he got rejected by Phantom Isle because I learned not to have nightmares anymore? I don't need sleep. I need answers. Okay, well, existential crisis aside, Klonoa is a pretty great game, and I definitely see why people love it so much. 
I love its style and presentation and creativity with the 2.5D stages, and the story is very interesting, and I'm actually hoping Klonoa will expand on it some in Klonoa 2. I'll be nitpicking that game soon along with the GBA game, so if you're interested in that, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If this video does pretty well, I'll prioritize Klonoa 2's review and get it out sooner. I just have a lot of other reviews on my plate that I'm doing at the moment, so if you actually do want to see my Klonoa 2 review, leave a like and let me know so I can get it out sooner rather than later. Anyway, shamelessly asking for likes aside, Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle is a pretty great game and I see the appeal for sure. The only thing I personally have against it is that I do feel as though the game can be fairly challenging for new players, so if you're new to platformers and platformers that aren't Sonic, you might have a bit of a hard time getting a grip on the game's difficulty. Just for the love of god, please play on easy. I know easy mode is for plebs, but please save yourself the headache. The game is a lot easier with not only infinite lives, but the buff range on the wind bullet. So if you play this game after this video, fully recommend playing on easy mode to help you get started. But if you think you're up to it, I highly recommend it. Klonoa 1 is a great game and I think you'll like it. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you liked it, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, got a bunch of great content in the works and I'll see you in the next one. Klonoa, do you want to say bye? Okay.